Houdini called himself the master mystifier of the age, the undisputed king of handcuffs. No ropes could bind him, no icy waters drown him. Imprisoned in chains or suspended in straitjackets, Houdini emerged from every restraint. Though denying he had supernatural powers, he spent his life in pursuit of death and hoped to communicate from beyond the grave. What were the secrets of the great Houdini? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. The great Houdini died on Halloween 1926. In death, he remains as enigmatic as he was in life. For years, he visited spiritual mediums and seances seeking proof of life after death. And shortly before he died, he promised to send word from the beyond, if he could. Houdini was perhaps the best known escape artist of all time. From the beginning, he was surrounded by mystery. Born Eric Weiss in Hungary in 1874, he would later claim Wisconsin as his birthplace. He was a restless child who rarely slept. His only consolation, the beat of his mother's heart. It became the driving rhythm of his life, an affirmation that all was well, even through difficult times. Magic fascinated young Eric and provided escape from a life of hardship. Already captivated by sleight of hand masters, he happened upon a book that would change his existence the life story and secrets of France's greatest conjurer, Robert Houdin. Taking Houdin's illusions and adopting his name, Eric became Houdini the Magician. These simple props, now in a museum, were among the first that he could afford as he struggled to survive in an already overcrowded field. In an attempt to appear successful, he dubbed himself the King of Cards. While playing beer halls on Coney Island, Harry fell in love with a beautiful young singer. Her name was Beatrice Runner. Harry called her Bess. She was part of an act called the Floral Sisters and just 18. Although Harry was Jewish and Bess Catholic, their romance blossomed. Despite her family's objections, within weeks she would become Mrs. Harry Houdini and join his act. The highlight of their show became a disappearing trick called metamorphosis, in which Harry and Bess would exchange places inside a bag, inside a trunk, in three seconds. Although audiences were intrigued by the illusion, it was not unique, and Harry would continue to seek new tricks. Handcuff escapes were common entertainment, though the audiences knew that performers used phony cuffs. But Harry practiced with real ones every night. He developed a locksmith's mastery of what became a huge collection and could escape from every cuff. Still, the audiences were unimpressed. So Houdini searched for a more challenging restraint. He found it in the straitjacket. After seeing an inmate at an insane asylum struggling futilely in such a device, Houdini was inspired to incorporate the stunt into his act. This rare piece of film documents his entire escape in less than three minutes.
yet even with the straitjacket, Houdini's climb to vaudeville fame seemed agonizingly slow. He despaired being at the bottom of the bill, below such acts as the tiniest triplets ever born. Desperate for publicity, he dared police to try to lock him in their cuffs. The challenge would become his trademark. Houdini expert and owner of many of his handcuffs is amateur magician Sid Radner. Houdini didn't invent the handcuff escape act, but he did perfect it. Unlike his competitors and the people who preceded him, Houdini took on all comers. Every sheriff, every chief of police, every deputy, everybody from the, anywhere could bring in handcuffs, ordinary handcuffs, bring them up on the stage. They had to be in good working order. And as long as they were in good working order, Houdini would accept the challenge and he would proceed to get out of these handcuffs, ordinary handcuffs, just as these are here. Finally, Houdini's skill caught the attention of a major vaudeville booker, and he and Bess started a national tour. They were paid $120 a week. For publicity, Houdini added jailbreaks to his repertoire, allowing police to strip and search him before locking him in a cell. Minutes later, Houdini would appear free, unfettered, and fully clothed. It was not until he toured Europe that he achieved the fame he had dreamed of. Success would stretch his tour to four years. France paid homage to the King of Cuffs. German theaters begged him to extend his tour. And in Russia, he freed himself from a Siberian paddy wagon. But escaping from bonds of rope and steel were not enough. To generate bigger audiences for his stage shows, he risked a drowning death. Houdini yearned to share his success with his now widowed mother. So he sent for her in Budapest, and giving her a gown designed for the late Queen Victoria, presented her like royalty to relatives and old family friends. Triumphantly, he returned to America as a vaudeville headliner, earning $1,200 a week. Drumming up business in each new town with increasingly hazardous stunts, it now seemed as though nothing could hold him. It was impossible for audiences to understand how he could survive in a box, in the dark, underwater, for four minutes. Only the few close to him knew how he picked locks with his toes and even dislocated his joints to escape. The crowds always wondered if this time Houdini would die. How often did he wonder himself? Death fascinated him, and he would frequently hire a local photographer to take his picture by a famous tombstone. He even arranged a stunt in which he was buried alive six feet deep. The weight of the earth nearly suffocated him. He swore he'd never attempt it again. Houdini delighted in convincing his audience he was always just a breath away from death. No stunt achieved that better than the water torture cell. The audience was allowed to inspect the 100-gallon tank, but they could never detect a trick. Behind a drawn curtain, Houdini would somehow escape and then wait unseen as minutes passed. When the audience could bear the tension no longer, Houdini would emerge, breathless, to their immense relief. Some were so amazed by Houdini's prowess, they were sure he possessed paranormal abilities. Magic expert Walter Gibson discussed this issue with Houdini during their friendship in the 1920s. The question has been raised about Houdini's um, approach to the supernatural. Many thought that he had mediumistic powers himself and that he didn't want to advertise that fact, so he simply pretended that his escapes were normal things. So they 
thought that the reason that he enclosed himself in a cabinet was to get the darkness that would bring spirit aid and that he actually would dematerialize from some of these contraptions in which he'd been placed. The more successful Houdini became, the more his mother was proud of him. Ironically, his act grew so popular they rarely saw each other anymore. When he and Bess set sail for another European tour, Mama came to say her farewell. It was the last time they would see her alive. Devastated by the loss, Houdini would spend hours by her grave, hoping for a word from beyond. The vigil became an obsession that would change the course of his life. Houdini entered a period of intense mourning following the death of his mother. He edged his stationery in black and published elaborate tributes to her. After a year, he recovered from his grief and burst upon the American scene with renewed vigor and purpose. The public response was greater than ever as Houdini introduced a new twist to his straitjacket escape. Although it appeared more dangerous, Houdini would later admit the inverted position made his release simpler. In city after city, his genius for publicity drew huge crowds and packed the theaters night after night. Movies made his tricks even easier. Playing characters named Harvey Hanford and Harry Harper, the movies and serials featured the stunts that had made him famous. Within a few years, he formed his own motion picture company. The theme of his first movie was reincarnation as Houdini comes back to life from an icy arctic grave as the man from beyond. The plot of the movie nearly caused him disaster at Niagara Falls. Despite Houdini's safety precautions, the stunt almost killed him and his co-star. those who say he encouraged these brushes with death. Death and what lay beyond would always fascinate Houdini, for this was the barrier that separated him from his beloved mother. Trying to contact her became an obsession. During the 1920s, spiritualism was widespread, giving hope to the living that they could communicate with the dead. Mediums prospered in darkened seance rooms, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, author of Sherlock Holmes, was one of its major advocates. On tour in England, Houdini accompanied Doyle to over 100 seances, but still no messages came from his beloved mother. So great was Houdini's distress and disappointment that Lady Doyle volunteered to use her powers to contact the spirit of his mother. A seance was held, and Lady Doyle began writing in a trance unaware of the words that flowed onto the paper. Oh, my darling, thank God at last I am through. I want to talk to my boy, my own beloved boy. Now I can rest in peace. First moved by this demonstration, Houdini later rejected it. Why was a cross drawn when his mother was Jewish? Why was the letter in English when she spoke only German and Yiddish? If Lady Doyle couldn't contact her, could anyone? Walter Gibson recalls Houdini's turn against spiritualism. Now, Houdini respected Conan Doyle, and he knew there were lots of believers of that type.
but he also knew that psychic matters, spiritualistic seances, were studded with fakers. And he started out to expose the fakes. Houdini and Bess knew all the tricks of the spooky trade. Billed in their struggling years as Professor Harry and Mademoiselle Beatrice, they faked spirit writing on a slate and did a phony mind-reading act. Now he attended seances disguised, exposing mediums in the course of their trickery. Soon he incorporated his debunking into his stage performance, demonstrating how bells were rung by spirits, how photographic negatives were tampered with to produce ghostly images, and how props were used to fake spirit voices. Somebody would hold a trumpet, Houdini would stand away from the trumpet and whisper, and they didn't see him whisper, but they would catch these voices as though they came through the trumpet, and he showed how that was done. He explained several other spiritualistic tricks, but the one that was most impressive was the slate writing. Houdini showed how a medium's accomplice would exchange a blank slate for one with writing, and how some mediums were so skilled they could write spirit messages with chalk between their toes. Houdini challenged mediums to prove their claims were real, and so did the prestigious journal, The Scientific American, whose publishers asked him to join their investigation committee. A young medium known as Marjorie claimed to manifest a wide range of psychic phenomena. However, when Houdini devised a special box to prevent her from manipulating objects in the dark, the phenomena ceased. When she failed to collect the award, Marjorie predicted imminent doom for Houdini. As he began his September tour in 1926, Houdini himself had the premonition he would never see his home again. Strangely, Houdini did not die performing a dangerous stunt. While waiting backstage before a show, he was punched in the stomach by a young man who had heard of Houdini's legendary iron midriff. Unfortunately, Houdini was caught off guard and had not prepared himself for the blow. He suffered for a week from a ruptured appendix and peritonitis. He died on Halloween. Houdini was buried in a coffin he had purchased for his act, a stack of his mother's letters under his head. Ironically, even though Houdini was proud of all the spiritualist fakery he exposed, he never lost his hope that there was life after death. While he lay dying, he made a pact with Bess that if it were possible to communicate from the other side, he would do so. They agreed upon a code that would prove the message was really from him. The words that would reunite them were inspired by the song that had brought them together. Rosa Bell, Believe. Bess did believe and kept the light of hope burning in their home. Mediums claimed to make contact with Houdini, but the code words were never right. Finally, the agreed upon message was produced by psychic Arthur Ford. Bess confirmed it at first, but later discovered there were ways he could have learned the code, ways that were not supernatural. On Halloween 1936, Ten years after Houdini's death, Bess and a circle of Houdini's friends met in Hollywood for a last seance. The event was recorded. Oh, thou disembodied spirits, we greet thee. It is the spirit of Houdini we wish to contact. Are you here, Houdini? Please manifest yourself in any way possible. We have waited, Houdini, oh, so long. Speak. Speak, Harry, in the name of humanity and love. If there is communication from the great beyond, come through with the evidence. Speak, 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 The evidence did not come. Bess sadly closed her final seance. My last hope is gone. I do not believe that Houdini can come back to me or to anyone. 
the Houdini shrine has burned for 10 years, I now reverently turn out the light. Good night, Harry. Buried with Houdini was his hope that he could be contacted after death. Although Bess gave up, there are still those who try to reach him and dream that he may yet be the man from beyond. Although Houdini's will specified that all his illusions and theatrical props be destroyed after his brother's death, many of them have survived in private collections. At the Houdini Hall of Fame in Niagara Falls, Canada, two of his challenges still wait to be met. Since his death more than 50 years ago, no other magician has exactly duplicated his escape from the water torture cell. And within this envelope is a secret code. So far, no medium has come forth with the precise code words to prove communication with the dead. No one could be more pleased that the challenges continue than the great Houdini. <laughs>